Daruba Ben Wahad. Daruba, what's happening? Uh, peace, brother. How you doing? Man, we're live on the rival. Everything good with you? Fighting fire with a feather. So you fighting fire with a feather? Yes, sir. Hey, man, I hope you got a pretty large feather, you know what I'm saying? Because it, it's definitely it's definitely burning, you know? So, um, uh, first off, you know, we appreciate you coming on. This is the 48th year anniversary of the Black Panther Party. For those brothers and sisters who are listening via internet, via telephone, via radio, whatever, um, who may be new to the whole concept or hearing about the Black Panther Party or who have been misled about what the Black Panther Party was, um, can you do us a favor and just give us uh, a history of what the Black Panther Party represented? And what the Black Panther Party meant to you? Uh, um, we can't. We have to deal with things in the um, within the historical context. So the Black Panther Party, um, uh, to me, and is um, represented the integrity of the Black community. You know, uh, I was raised in I was raised in New York, Bronx, and Harlem, so I was accustomed to type of treatment uh, by, by the police and uh, and this treatment you know uh, gave me a fuller appreciation of the, of, of, of the role that law enforcement played in our community to intimidate to brutalize us how this was institutional and um, now this was part and policy of the policy of containment you know um, been up chap channeling and and curtailing a uh, uh, black rage and militancy in, in, in among you. So uh, when the Black Panther Party came along and enunciated the concept, idea of self-defense, we had a right to self-defense. But all human beings had a right to self-defense. And that we should organize us along those lines and understand the role of violence in the United States. How white supremacy has used violence to terrorize and intimidate us historically. And... Um, and how uh, it was necessary at that time for us to take a stand. And um, so, you know, that, that's what the Black Panther Party meant to me. It meant to assume um, a, a struggle for the integrity uh, of our self, our self-esteem, our own integrity, and, and our manhood. Um, as far as my political development as a consequence of that, of course, um, once you become involved in the struggle, once you become involved in the fight, you realize that it's the fight itself that's important, and that um, and that to be involved in the fight uh, itself is 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 absolutely important. Um, and 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 your consciousness and your understanding of a lot of things you're doing will uh, you know will 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 develop. But of course, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. Um, I didn't expect to live this long. Um, I think there's a lot of older. Um, revolutionaries who didn't expect to be around this long. And so uh, the downside of that is when you're around too long, you get to see how the forces of reaction validated their power and and have us once again uh, enthralled in in useless endeavors and useless struggles um, and reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Hmm. So um, it's sad to see the successes of the opposition but it's heartening now to see the young people are stepping up and trying to um, take take their destiny into their own hands. Right. Let me ask you this because of the fact that, again, um, you know, a lot of youth more or less, uh, and unfortunately even some folks who uh, consider themselves elders, they look at the Black Panther Party as some type of form, some type of nostalgic type situation. Um, you know, just just from from your experience, you know, you being on the east coast of the United States, um, what what were some of the programs that 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 the Black Panther Party started, and what were some of the uh, the, the the movements that were made, more or less? Uh, you know, because because oftentimes folks see, you know, the 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 Feed the People program, the Breakfast for Children program, they see. You know, Panthers carrying guns, so on and so forth, marching and rallying. What are some of the other things that, you know, the Black Panther Party 
brought into existence for, for folks who may not have a clue as to what the Black Panther Party was about? Well, one of the things that the party brought into existence was um, was the idea and the concept of um, was the idea and the concept of of, of decentralization of public safety hmm. and and how and how that was important to um, to uh, to understand that we had to control that we had to control the um, the um, the instruments of, of public safety, those things that that, that, that impacted on our daily lives, uh, and that included um, um, law enforcement, um, a police, a fire, a first responders, um, um, EMS, emergency medical services. These things that are very important to people who are living in in condensed urban populations, uh, uh, urban centers. These services are essential to the health and well-being of, 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 of inner-city um, communities. And, and uh, African people, black people in the United States, have no control over these institutions, hmm. have no control over the policy or the, or the, or the allocation of funds or of, of, of these very vital uh, uh, agencies. And so one of the things the Black Panther Party did in 1968 and, um, and um, 67, 67, 68, was to organize national committees to combat fascism across the United States. Now, these national committees were 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 all, were, 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 were formations of activists in different cities who felt that they related to the politics of the Black Panther Party, um, that they understood the situation in more or less the same terms as the Black Panther Party. And they came together to combat fascism, to combat the consolidation of right-wing racist power in the United States that was occurring at that time in 68 and 69. And, um, and this right-wing consolidation of racist power and militarism was going on in pursuit of the Vietnam War and in repression of the black nationalists and black rebellions, uh, black nationalist movement and black rebellions in uh, across America at that time. So, so people came together to combat this consolidation between right right wing white supremacy and 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 the police and the militarized police. And of course, the Black Panther Party was the foremost target of of this militarization. In fact. The whole idea and concept of SWAT teams as developed in L.A. Um, were, were, were aimed at, um, at suppressing and, um, uh, the Black Panther Party and the mm. Black Underground wow. and, and containing rebellions in the black community. So SWAT teams and, and the militarized police we see today uh, have their auspices in, uh, um, in the period of 67, 68, and 69. When the Law Enforcement Assistance Association was set up by um, by then President uh, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson in order to uh, deal with Black Rebellion, so so one of the things that people that, that we've learned is that whenever you deal with the police in the Black community, you're dealing with an occupying army, you're dealing with a military force, you're dealing with the armed agents of the state, and these armed agents of the state. Their role in our community is to control and contain us and to terrorize and intimidate us and to make sure that we depend completely on them for our safety and well-being. And the Black Panther Party said, well, that's, if that's the case, we should decentralize the police. Hmm. We, should, we should require that these come from our communities, that they live in our communities. We should take control of the command and control structure of the police in our community and, and determine the policing policies in our community. And this decentralization program, we put to these NCCFs that we had organized around the country, and we proposed decentralization of, this, of, of, of the police in several major New York cities, in several major cities, New York, uh, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, um, uh, I think oh, maybe uh, Chicago, um, L.A., and um, and and these these this, these campaigns were carried forward with great vigor, and uh, we recruited lawyers, we recruited uh, human rights activists, 
uh, to work on these programs and get these and get this legislation on the local ballot, on the referendum, hmm. um, uh, by referendum, local ballot, decentralization of the police. And the response that we got was from the police unions. The police unions uh, uh, marshaled all of the political influence and power that they could muster in order to thwart decentralization of the police. And because it was so popular with black people at that time, this idea and concept of the police living amongst them, being responsible to them, because this idea was so popular, uh, the police unions mounted multi-million dollar campaigns to to flip the issue, to flip the script, and 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 um, and transfer or transform demands for for decentralization into community review boards, right? And setting up another. In a civilian complaint review board to siphon off um, any any legitimate um, uh, efforts to control the police in the black community, and of course they recruited the local lackeys and Negroes and preachers in order to um, um, to, to to do this. And so in New York City, for instance, we got the referendum on the ballot to decentralize the police, and the police union. The, um, the PBA, the Police Benevolent Association in New York City, spent over $3 million in mounting a campaign to put posters up in the subways, ads on the TV, so that people would be confused about the issue. And they basically had a poster that said, uh, if you want decentralization, if you, if, if you mean yes, say no, and if you mean no, say yes. Wow. Say yes for decentralization, say yes for community control, um, for the community review board and no for decentralization, you know, and um, and so you know it worked, wow. and New York City got a um, million complaint review board, mm. and we see what happened with that. Since then, there's been dozens of murders of black men in New York City. Brutal. The New York City Police Department is one of the most brutal and racist in the country. Um, it, it, it pioneered the whole idea and concept of stop and frisk and racial profiling in urban areas. Um, so, and this is with a civilian complaint review board. Wow, wow. So, 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 so basically, you that's say, the history, right? So basically, you saying like um, you mentioned the whole the whole setup of the SWAT. And you mentioned a civilian review board as being a pretty much a pacifist situation to kind of keep the people at bay, more or less. Is that what you're saying? Be yeah, it was institution. They created an institution so that and, and funded this institution to siphon off the radical, the radical demands of, of, of organizations like the Black Panther Party that had traction in the black community. Right. And that people understood to be reasonable. Um, and, 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 and this has worked time and time again. I mean, it's worked, it, it works internationally. The United States does this, has, has done the same thing. Um, it's doing the same thing right now when it creates this coalition to go after ISIL in the Middle East. It creates this bogus, this bogus institution, this bogus formation, so that the reactionaries can all come together under this umbrella and claim that they're fighting for some type of ideal or some type of principle. And this is the same thing that they did with the Negro, with the Negro conflict class of the 68 and 69. These Negroes were scared to death of black militancy. They were the ones that were fearful of Malcolm X. They were the ones that wanted to oppose the Black Panther Party publicly, but because the Black Panther Party and radical organizations were popular at that time, they didn't dare oppose them without, for fear of being labeled Uncle Toms. So they worked secretly with the COINTELPRO uh, 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 operations in the city to undermine organizations like the Black Panther Party, to um, to to stop us from putting our breakfast programs in certain places, uh, student unions, many some of the teachers that you have today to teach in Black history, in the Black history departments collaborated with various uh, uh, COINTEL pro operations to to stigmatize the Black Panthers as as an organization that was controlled by whites and had white people in it, and and these cultural nationalists were running around the campus talking these uh, this this trash to the point where. When the Black Panther Party wanted to convene a constitutional convention in Washington, D.C., a, pl a, a plenary session at, on Howard University, the FBI approached the student union there and the faculty there in order to bar the Panthers from using uh, Howard University as the venue. And we wound up using a church, a Glide Memorial Church, I believe. Uh, one, of, one of them was, uh, no, no, another church. 
in in DC, a multi um, a multi denominational church gave us their facilities. So we see that, you know, historically, it's been the black the black so called black leadership, the black um, and mainly the black entrepreneurial class and and stakeholders who have been the uh, major recipients of of institutional of institutional largesses and, and, and funding to set up institutions and set up uh, these types of programs that 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 um that that siphon off our rage and, and render us powerless. Hmm. And you can see this today. The, the unions it's the unions that 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 that, that have enforced the uh, that, that that have enforced institutional policies that prohibit us from questioning these murderous cops, these cop these Cop killers, these, these 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 murderers of black youth. It's 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 their passages of an enforcement of a policeman bill of rights and intimidation of local local elected officials by the police unions that have um, that have stopped us from getting justice from these grand juries whenever the police murder us. Why do you think this process takes so long? Why do you think none of these cops are ever brought to book? Why do you think it takes so long for us just to get their names whenever they brutalize and murder us? It's the police union. Wow. It was the police union, um, it was the police union that, in, that, 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 um, that, 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 that intimidated the uh, Obama Justice Department and Eric Holder to put a million dollar bounty on the side of Shakur's head in order to uh, um, in, in order to appease law enforcement in the United States as the United States moves towards uh, um, a, a reapproachment and accommodations with Cuba and the lifting of the blockade in the future. So so we we can see that the police unions are the ones that are behind uh, most of the uh, uh, delays in justice and 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 blockading um, 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 justice whenever these police murder us. And finally, um, we could see this in the case of Mumia Abu Jamal just recently. Right. We see now that the that the paternal order of police have moved into the state legislature in um, in Pennsylvania to 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 pass a law prohibiting. A prisoners from broadcasting or inter being interviewed in prison and from people who support them and their families from commenting on their cases and 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 their status in the mass media they're getting they're trying to pass a bill to muzzle Mumia Abu Jamal's uh, prison radio program right I saw that so, it's and it's the police union right Right. It's the police union that writes these letters to the parole board and say that our political prisoners shouldn't be released from prison because of the of the heinous crimes that they committed and these families of police officers are without their father and all of this stuff. But they don't tell you that it was the police who were kicking in the doors and murdering the Fred Hamptons and murdering us. They didn't tell you that they were at war with us and that we were at war with them and that they killed us and they murdered our families and terrorized our families. We don't get that type of equal airtime that the union gets to portray the cops as victims in the 60s rather than aggressors. So it's the police unions that are the real enemy of, 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 of justice in this state. And we're not just talking about police unions as in, in terms of patrolmen. We're talking about all of these armed agents of the state have unions. Right. And these unions are very powerful, influential across the board, institutionally in America. America's a police state, so the police unions have more power than black people. Right. In, in 1969, Jager Hoover said that um, the Black Panther Party, without question, represents the greatest threat to internal security of the country. Um, and he pledged that in 69 it would be the last year of the party. And we noticed that that same year, Chairman Fred Hampton um, was murdered out in Chicago, along with um, Deputy Minister of Defense uh, Mark Clark. And we know that... Um, you know, folks like yourself was later um, captured and, and, and charged with the whole situation with the Panther 21. And once you all beat that, you were framed again. Uh, for the listeners, you did 19 years um, as a victim of counterinsurgency, the whole COINTELPRO situation. Can you give us a, a brief uh, of, of, of how that came about and how did you end up uh, being released after that 19 year piece? 
Well, that's a long story, bro. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, well, you know, basically, that's a long story. I, I mean, I guess it's 19 years worth. <laughs> but I'm saying, I'm saying, like, uh, <laughs> but um, to, to condense it all, um, I think I think many many of the listeners um, who are tuned into the program probably have a basic understanding of COINTELPRO, the FBI's secret counterintelligence program that was carried out uh, in the United States against um, against the uh, uh, first the um, the left the uh, white left and um, and and later on against the black nationalists and uh, pan African movements. Of course, the techniques of COINTELPRO, um, the divide and conquer techniques, the the racist. Um, disinformation and and, um, and stigmatizing of black leaders, of course, in the case of African people in the U- U.S., began ever since we, you know, ever since Ply- Plymouth Rock landed on us, and uh, and so a lot of these techniques were developed on the plantation. Right. You know, um, allowing blacks to get together on Sundays to hoop and holler and and make sure that the preacher monitored everybody and anyone that talked about overthrowing Mazza, you understand the preacher would go snitch on them and 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 that slave would be sold to another plantation. Yeah. You know, th- these techniques, you know, were all initiated um, in the course of. Of, of developing chattel slavery and extermination and the genocide of the native people. But having said that, the actual COINTELPRO counterintelligence program that was aimed at us was a Cold War strategy. It was a strategy designed to contain the domestic colonial status of African people in the U.S. In, in, while, it, while the United States carried out its, 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 um, its empire or, or, or wars abroad mainly in Vietnam, in Korea, uh, before Vietnam, and um, in, Indo, in, 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 um, in the Middle East. Um, uh, all, of these, all of these contradictions at that time that came about at the end of World War II when the uh, French and the British and, and, and the other colonial powers had lost their empires and, and African nationalism was on the rise, pan-Arabism was on the rise, um, Islamic, Islamic um, uh, 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 resistance to Western um, uh, 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 institutions was on the rise. This was a very volatile period, right. and so um, when, the, when 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 we look at the counterintelligence program, we have to understand it in this context that it was a program of war. It was a program of domestic war, a, uh, um, a, a psychological war being waged against the people that the government. And that's us, black folks, the people that the government perceive as as as, as subversive threats to the to, 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 to the national security state, to the state of, of uh, to the republic. And this is how we have been viewed ever since ever since the uh, Civil War and the end of the Civil War and the reapproachment between the North and South. We have always been viewed as a population that was susceptible to revolutionary ideology from abroad, to revolutionary influences from abroad. We were always treated like children in this respect, like we didn't have an original idea of self-determination on our own, that we didn't have a concept of wanting to control our own destiny, that we had to be influenced from the outside, that we had to be influenced by communism or something like that. But the radical tradition that it came all the way from Denmark, Vesey, from Sojourner Truth, the radical tradition of Malcolm X, of, of, of Marcus Garvey, the radical tradition of black nationalism, of the black pioneers, and of the original Black Panther Party. None of this radicalism was considered by white supremacy as being indigenous uh, or, 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 or having any type of, 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 of impact um, on, the, on the masses of black people. It was just race consciousness and race extremists. And by the time the 1960s rolled around, this, this, this myth, this, this, this perception, this misperception was blown away, especially after uh, Kwame Torre and, um, and, uh, and the brothers and sisters in SNCC um, at, the, at the Pettus Bridge declared black power to be, to be um, the, uh, the, the, the mantra and the slogan with a new age of black militancy and radicalism. And at that point, the United States government realized that what they were dealing with was a homegrown nationalist movement that had an internationalist component, that understood imperialism, that understood class contradictions for the first time, that we understood 
that and that the Black Panther Party represented that understanding when it came into existence because it was one of the first cadre organizations, one of the first organizations that had democratic socialism as its organizing principle and a revolutionary ideology of, of, of overthrow of capitalism in the capitalist state. And there had never been a black organization that was like that and that advocated self-defense, armed self-defense, and that saw a resistance of armed self-defense in proactive terms as well as reactive terms. In other words, we believe that the best um, uh, offense was a good defense and that that defense also implied that we had to be proactive as well as reactive. And therefore, the black underground came into existence and organizations and responses like the Black Liberation Army and uh, uh, came into being uh, at that time. Right on. You're listening to Contraband Classified Sucker Free Radio. This is the 48th year anniversary of the Black Panther Party. We're commemorating 48 years since... uh, that form of resistance was implemented. Without further ado, we would like to introduce you to our esteemed guest, Brother Daruba Wahad. Ben Wahad. How do you how you pronounce that? Daruba Al Mujahid. Mujahid Ben Wahad. There, there's a lot in the name. Absolutely, absolutely. Build on that. There's a lot in the name, and you know we say Daruba Al Mujahid Ben Wahad. Um, there's a lot that comes with that. So let's start this interview. With you explaining the meaning of your name, I think that says a lot about why it's so important, why you're so important to us. Yeah, so my first name is actually Swahili, and it means storm. My whole name, um, my whole Swahili name was, um, it was uh, Anaya Zaliwa Duruba. It means he who was born in the storm. And um, I got it in prison uh, when I first became conscious as as an activist, as a black nationalist in prison in the uh, early 60s. And it was given to me by some brothers in prison. They felt that the name should reflect your personality and reflect your conditions. And, and you know, it's the African tradition to have names that reflect uh, where you come from or the conditions under which you were born. Uh, like in Akan, for instance, the, a culture in, in, in Ghana, um, uh, children are usually named after the their first name is namely, usually named after the day of the week they were born. And then their middle name is usually reflective of their, um, their mother or father, depending on if they're male or female's um, mother or their grandmother. So that the name of the, of the father or the patriarch relives again in each generation. So you have, this is why you have these names. So my first name is Daruba. And when I got out of prison and got involved in the struggle on the outside, um, <clears throat> and um, my name was still Daruba, but when I returned to Islam um, around when I was about 39, 40, uh, I took on the attribute of, of al-Mujahid, which means uh, al-Mujahid, al-Mujahideen is a holy warrior, mm-hmm. one who fights in the way of Allah. And um, translated into the non-secular terms, it's one who fights on the side of the oppressed, who fights for justice. Because there's a passage in the Quran that says, uh, O ye who believe, let there arise from among you a band of people who will enjoin the right and forbid the wrong. And there's another passage that says, um, for those who cry out for help, for those who are oppressed, for those who are, who are oppressed by tyrants, who are imprisoned, whose women and children are fatherless, who will come to their aid if not the Mujahideen? So, so the term was meant one who fights for justice, one who fights for, peop- for the people. And my last name, uh, Ben Wahad, um, Ben, Ben or um, <clears throat> Ben or Ibn means uh, means son. And when it's usually Ben, it means uh, the family, a tribe. And so uh, Ben Wahad, and Wahad is from the Arabic Ahad, which means one. So Ben Wahad means family of one. Mm. So my name is uh, Daruba, the holy warrior, born of the family of one. Mm. That's beautiful. That's real heavy. Heavy, heavy, heavy. I want to do something real quick um, before we go further. For the listeners out there, um, I would like to uh, tell a little bit of the history of of who you are. I know we we briefly Mm -hmm. you you mentioned it earlier. Um, I think it's important for people to understand, like you know, our our heroes that are still alive today, 
And when you talk about being from a, a tribe, like this brother is um, a co-founder of the Black Liberation Army, um, which is which is the truth. Where you have to do your homework on the Black Liberation Army because this is a this this these are the people who are on the front line for for uh, African Americans, uh, freedom, justice, and equality. Um, this is a brother who is was a original member of the Black Panther Party. Um, and you, you did you grow up in Oakland? No, I grew up in the South Bronx. South Bronx. So, so it translated from Oakland to New York City. And um, what was it like when you was uh, out there pounding the pavement with the Panthers? Uh, I, you know, I was just having this conversation with a sister um, um, who you may know, Hakim, a uh, sister Dequi. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, who's, yeah, who's, who's know Yeah, who's married to political prisoner uh, and prisoner of war Sekou Odinga. Mm -hmm. Sekou Odinga, uh, he grew up in he grew up in South Jamaica, by the way, right. and um, <clears throat> he's a comrade of Osada Shakur. In fact, he was one of the brothers that that um, that broke Osada Shakur out of prison. Right. Um, and Sekou was, was also one of the Panther Twenty One. Uh, I'll talk about them later, but um, the reason why I mention all of that is because what a lot of people don't understand that there has always been a radical tradition in America, in black America. Mm -hmm. We've always had our radicals. We've always had those on this plantation that said, you know, let's hit the plantation master in the head with a hatchet and escape. Right. And then you always had the other ones that said, man, we can't do that. Where are we going to run? Where are we going to hide? And then there's, as, as Malcolm said, then, then there's the other rebellious one that says, any place is better than here, right. you see? And, and then you always had the moderators in there, look, we could resist, but we don't have to kill him. You know, we could do this and we can do that, you know? And so there's always been a radical tradition and that's natural in any people who are, whether oppressed or not, that there's people who take uh, a, a, a radical pos a position based on their perceptions of how, how extreme the situation is, okay? but we are the only people who have a history in which the radical tradition has been completely eradicated. Mm -hmm. It's been written out be because it was the bootlickers and the modifiers and the, and the integrationists who won the day. Yeah. So they wrote out the history that, that contributed to them having any prestige to begin with. There wouldn't have been the type of tension and dynamic of Martin Luther King's relationship to the state if there wasn't a Malcolm X. Right. Margaret Garvey, uh, organized the largest uh, uh, um, uh, black organization ever known in North America, Marcus Mugosaya Garvey, and he was a Pan-African nationalist, okay? And at that time, his contemporaries were, um, were Padmore, his contemporaries were, were Du Bois, his contemporaries were Booker T. Washington, you understand, who preached, some who preached compromise and others who preached integration and who wanted to be called Negro, not African. So there was this radical tradition all throughout our history, okay? But today, people don't know that that radical tradition exists. And the reason why is because back in the 60s, in the late 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, black America was on the point of revolutionary consciousness. This was race consciousness being translated by a, by a nation that was at war that was denying basic human rights to people, to, to entire swaths of people, whether immigrant populations, the black population, that has become, that it became urbanized, that it became <clears throat> increasingly fearful of the black population. And so radicals of those day at that time were attacked actively by the government, mm -hmm. covertly by the government too, because they used other black people against radicals, whether they used the church or whether they used the old axiom of divide and conquer. This is what they did. So there was a radical tradition. People don't know that the lunch, pro that the lunch programs and breakfast programs that they have in schools today were, were the products of radicals. Right, yeah, right. That the Black Panther Party is the one that started feeding children in school. Yeah, women and children. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so this. And my point is, is that this, so this, so this radical influence on, 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 on human rights, influencing the populations to move, to acquire their human rights, whether it's to self-defense, whether it's to a better education, whether it's to decent housing, came from the radical movements mm -hmm. in this country. Okay. And 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 so when you ask me what it was like to be in the Black Panther Party at this time, you have to understand at that particular time the Black Panther Party was considered by the U.S. government 
you know, the most radical and, 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 and threatening of organizations, not so much because we had so many people in the organization, but because of the ideology of the organization. And the ideology and organization came hand in hand to become very unique in our history, okay? The Black Panther Party didn't exist in its radical and militant form for more than three or four years. But it's had an impact so that we know about it from generations past. So there's never been an organization that has had that that big of an influence over generations and has been so small and lasted so le- hmm. such a long, short time. There's a reason for that. And the reason for that is because the Black Panther Party, at that historical moment, personified the contradiction of black people's right to self-defense against racist attack. Whether it was illegal racist attack, so-called illegal racist attack by vigilantes, or whether it was law enforcement's racist attacks. That we had a right to defend ourselves, to defend our homes, to defend our children. And this is a right that even Condoleezza Rice attributed to, uh, 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 attributed to her father, who was a preacher. She said that her father and the other people in her community uh, armed themselves to defend themselves against the Ku Klux Klan and the yeah, Night Riders. Condoleezza Rice said this. Condoleezza Rice said this mm-hmm. in an interview with the NRA. So she said that the Second Amendment right was just as important as any other amendment right because if it wasn't for her father mm-hmm. and the men organizing themselves to defend themselves in Alabama at that time and in Mississippi, she wouldn't be here. And that's the side of the story we don't get to hear often. Okay, right. but, uh, but, but exactly because the radical tradition is written out. Mm-hmm. So the Black Panther Party... Mm-hmm. The Black Panther Party um, uh, um, uh, represented this fundamental right of self-defense, but it went further than that because the original Black Panther Party in the South recognized the rights of black people to go to the polls and vote and decided to defend that right. Now, we, we, you said the original Black Panther Party in the South. Yeah, of Lyons County. In Lyons can, County. Can you, can you clarify that? Because most people associate the Black Panther Party with Oakland. Right. And then other parts of the country later, they don't know the original Black Panther Party was rooted in the South. Yes. <clears throat> the, the, the Oakland-based Black Panther Party, which was started by Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton in, 1960, um, in 1966, was, um, was, was different than the Lowndes County Black Panther Party in the South, which, which came into existence alongside the Freedom Democratic Party. It was, it, the Lowndes County Black Panther Party uh, came into existence to defend black people who were trying to get the right to vote. And the Black Panther became a symbol of, 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 of that right to vote because the only symbols that were allowed in the voting booths were the elephant mm, and, the, and, oh. and the donkey, you see? And, and the voters were being threatened and voters were being intimidated. It's not just the tax, the poll tax. They were physically being threatened and intimidated by the Ku Klux Klan, mm-hmm. uh, who many of them were either Republicans or Democrats themselves, mm-hmm. okay? We're talking about white supremacy here in the South, right. naked white institutional supremacy. And, um, and so the organization of black people in the South by the Freedom Party and Democratic Party and the Black Panthers in the South was designed to empower people and give them the, um, the, op- the opportunity to vote. But because they didn't, because a lot of folks were illiterate and, um, and would go into the voting polls, they voted by symbols. And because black people in the South, you know, if you go to people's homes back in the day, they should all have a panther on, panther, the, yeah. on the on the, um, <laughs> on the on the mantle. You know, there's a little wow. sleek black panther on the mantle yeah. on the TV and all of that. So 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 the organizers understood that wow. black people could identify a panther. panther right. So they used that symbol to put in the voting booth. So all they told the people was just press the panther. Wow. You see, and so that was the original Black Panther Party. Now when Huey P. Newton came along. And this is something that people don't understand, and this is something I always try to instill, and you know this, Hakim, because we go back a long time, even when you were working with TJ and them in mm-hmm. the campaign, is I try to get, get you to understand that, that history makes men and women, but men and women also determine the course of history. Yeah. The historical moment determines whether someone steps up to the plate or not and becomes this historical figure, okay? So it's the historical moment, at that historical moment in 1966, at the height of police brutality, and we have to understand that when we talk about police brutality in America, we're talking about an institutional behavior that has been in existence since the days of slavery. Policing in America, especially in the South, was designed to control the black population. 
okay? This is why you had these racist county sheriffs. This is why you we have driving while black. This is why we have racial profiling. These are just the modern manifestations of these policies that grew out of slavery and grew out of the policing methodologies uh, with people of color, okay? So police brutality is institutional, okay? There is such a thing as, you know, suspicion of being suspicious. It's a statute, but it's not on the books. Yeah. It's in the mind of the law enforcement officer. Okay, so because of the, because the police <clears throat> are, are are not a working class, they're not workers. They're not they're agents of the state. Mm -hmm. They're armed agents of the state. They're the only civilians and civil servants who have the power of life and death over you, and they have a mandate to protect property. That's their first job. Their job is not necessarily right, not to, protect to, to protect you. It has nothing to do with you. It has to serve to to to, to protect to property serve. and public order. Okay, and that's all in the mind of the person who's being protected and who's protecting you. What constitutes public order? It's disorder to see a black man in the street with a gun telling the cop that I have rights. That's totally disorder, out of order. That's out of order. That's out of that's out of their order. So, when Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale started the Black Panther Party, they were in living in Oakland, California, which was a a, a predominantly black community, and that black community in Oakland, California was primarily a migrant community in that the people that lived there were barely a generation old, okay? Very few people were actually born there, you know, for, for, because that population uh, exploded during World War II because there's naval bases there. And, the pot, and they brought black people there to load the ships, to service the naval base. Right. No, so that black community became very crowded. Housing became cheap. It became a ghetto, okay? And so by the time Huey P. Newton came along, 25 years or 20 years, uh, 25 years or so after the World War II, the black population there was being terrorized by racist police yeah. who came from Texas and Louisiana wow. and, 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 and all of these things. So the black community was subject to these just vicious police brutality. But because it was California and because it was never expected that the black populations would become majorities in these areas, the laws, the, the application of the right to bear arms applied to white Wh folks. Right. Yeah. So, black, so Huey P. Newton, being a law student, saw that you could carry a loaded gun in public. You could legally carry it in public as long, long as you didn't have a round in the chamber. Mm -hmm. You could carry a, a pistol or a shotgun in public. Wow. So he combined that with the law book, and, he, uh, and it said that you could observe a public servant. And you got to remember, we just revisited this issue of taking pictures of public servants while they're doing their yeah, job. With your with, case, with yeah. what we want to get to. Yeah, but with, generally, remember with Fruitvale Station and and the police went going to the Supreme Court saying that uh, civilians didn't have a right to, to, to photograph, photograph an off officer, and the, and the Supreme Court ruled that we did. Yes, sir. Okay, so this was the issue back then. Okay, this was the beginning yeah. of the issue in terms of modern technology because Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale decided to patrol the police. Right. Yes, right. And so they were armed and when they would see the police stop a black man, which was routine, and throw him across the hood and slap him up and terrorize, go in his pockets and terrorize, and terrorize him yeah. Yeah. And, and throw him in the back of the car, you know. The original, or, or, the original stop and frisk. Yeah, yeah, when they saw that, they would get out of the car and they would go to the legal distance that a civilian can go to observe an officer in the performance of his duty, which was, I think, 30 or 40 feet. And they would stand there, and they would observe the officer perform his duty. Mm. And then if the officer was violating the rights of the... Um, of the uh, civilian, they would read a passage from the from the from the law book, from the law from book the saying code. you have a right to remain <laughs> silent. You don't have to say anything. You could ask for That's a right. lawyer, and they would say this in a loud voice so that the person would hear them. Now here's a black guy that's always getting thrown up against the wall by Popo. You understand? We know the script, yeah. you know. And he turns around, and there's two black men there, one with a shotgun and one with a 45 on his hip in the law book. Wow. And they, and he's telling the Popo, you understand? Look, you don't have to answer that question, black man. You don't have to answer that pig, black man. And the cop is looking around to see these guys with guns. He calls backup. Mm. The backup comes. Now, the, you got to remember, the Panthers at this time are armed and the police are armed. So the police look over at the Panthers and say, you know, what are you doing with that gun, boy? Right. They're pointing it at you. Yeah, point, <laughs> you know, and, and you got it in your holster. Say, statute so-and-so and so-and-so, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, gun codes of uh, state of California state that any citizen of the state of California could bear arms in public as long as such and such and such and such pig this gun is loaded I got it on my hip you got your gun I got my gun what you got to say about this pig mm. 
you know, so so now the brother that's getting frisked this is like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. This is a new recruit. Empowering. <laughs> this is a new recruit. Now the police got to either go for his gun or back down. Back down. So, you know, initially they didn't know what to do. So they had to go back and sign us up on this. They said, well, first of all, we got to change the law. There you go. We got to move the goalposts here. So the first time that the Black Panther Party came to the recognition of the American public was when they had the legislation on the being debated in Sacramento, California to change the gun carry laws in California in order to thwart the Black Panthers from carrying guns and patrolling the police. Huey Newton, Huey Newton and, uh, uh, sent a delegation to, to Sacramento, California, mm. armed delegation with guns. With guns. Walked up to and the walked into the state house armed to read a manifesto that Huey wrote, which the Black Panther Party called Executive Order Number One. Whew. Come and, on. And Executive Order Number One of Huey P. Newton said that black people are here by warm, arm yourself or harm yourself. Mm. That you have a right to defend yourself. And this legislature's uh, 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 actions is attempting to take away the right of black people to defend themselves from racist attack. Okay? And so we read this Executive Order Number One. Of course, the NRA didn't defend the Black Panther Party's right to de, uh, to bear arms. They didn't come out. They didn't come out and say, you know, the Panthers have a right to bear arms. No. But you got to understand something. If you go through right wing literature now, gun culture literature, mm -hmm. they they use the Black Panther Party history as a part of the citizens' right to bear arms. You know right, that right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you go on the if you go on the, some of these right wing web websites, they're talking about we've always resisted the state right to try to take our guns from us. Even back in the '60s, when the Black Panther Party went to Sacramento, they claimed yeah, that. See, see, and that's that's that, that's a common thing. <laughs> of hijacking of culture and inserting yourself in history when you weren't there or you were on the wrong side. That's so you right. got to protect your history. I got Still, laugh. you want to say something, though. <laughs> well, you know, when you were speaking about um, the police and police brutality, uh, you actually was wrongly convicted um, for murder of... Um, attempted murder. Uh, attempted murder of police officers and served 19 years, correct? Yes. Um, so I understand that they initially, the initial um, charges you know, had nothing to do with uh, attempt murder. It was, uh, well, it, they did and they didn't. You see, this is what, this is, I know I got kind of long-winded on answering your question. Like, what was it like? That yeah, plane was up in there a long time. Bro. Yeah, I know, man. I know everybody had to go for oxygen. Nah, well, the people out there, they need that, they need that information. You, you know, know they, like they, a layover somewhere down there. I, mean, I know. <laughs> they had to come down peanuts. Touch down in Chicago. They had to come lay. down the aisle with, with peanuts and refreshments. So. <laughs> So, so yeah, yeah, I know. So, but to answer this, so when Huey P. Newton and them did this, and they and and the, and the Panthers came into national prominence, it became clear to the state that they had to destroy this organization, root and branch, because the symbolism of this organization was the symbolism of organized black men with guns. Right. Then on top of that, they adopted a philosophy of an enemy of the empire, Mao Zedong. They adopted the philosophy of dialectical materialism. Now on the surface it looks like Marxist Leninist, but it wasn't mm -hmm. because Mao Zedong had already fallen out with Moscow over the interpretation of Marxism mm. wow. and how it applies to the third mm. world. And that fallout had occurred already with Mozambique, with Filimo, with Swapo, with all the liberation movements in Africa. But mm -hmm. this is a whole nother story. But for us, the situation then became a, a, place, a, 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 a condition of war. So to the black nationalist movement, especially to the Black Panther Party, which became fully the 70% the of the COINTELPRO, counterintelligence operations aimed at the black community, 70% right. of them at the height of this program were aimed at the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. They weren't aimed at Dr. King, although they did target King and we know that. Right. They weren't aimed at the Nation of Islam, although they already had infiltrated the Nation of Islam and they already targeted uh, uh, that organization. And it predated uh, the Black Panthers. By 1966, uh, I mean 1967, 70 to 75 percent of all of the counterintelligence operations in America was aimed at the Black Panther Party. Probably so we were in a state one. of war. We were in a state of war. And, that, and, and, and people don't understand that our movement was being attacked and we were in a physical, psychological, and sociological state of war. Right. So that, did that, that, is, that the, um, is that the birth of the uh, BLA? Well, yeah, initially the Black Panther Party was a, it was a mass organization. 
it was an organization that anybody could join. I mean, right. you could come in and go to political education classes and, you know, commit some time and become a member of the Black Panther Party. With the state of war, when it was initiated, the party became infiltrated. You had entire chapters that were founded by snitches. Mm. So it became infiltrated. Mm. And therefore, um, the Central Committee at that time, uh, with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, closed the ranks of the Black Panther Party to new membership. And we understood that this was an assault by the state, by the police agencies of the state against radicals in America, period. So we called for interna a national conference to combat fascism in America in 1968, mm -hmm. early 68. And we established then chapters called the National Committees to Combat Fascism. And anybody could join these committees. From, from what I understand, the Black Liberation Army is, um, was established to protect the, uh, the the more severe rights of of the people in the community, as 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 well as just to be the front line for when it goes down, the revolution, so to speak. Oh, that's putting it. Man, that's being diplomatic, but you should have been a diplomat. Oh wow! <laughs> a actually, you see, the Black Panther Party. You know, I just explained to you, you know, how Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, you know, how the, why the Black Panther Party became, you know, the focus of this repression because it was about the right to, con you know, self-defense. But we all know from football that the best defense is a good offense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the best offense is a good defense, you know. And so <clears throat> there came a point when the infiltration and, and, um, and, and disruption of the Black Panther Party's ability to exercise re basic fundamental rights, you know, to organize people in the streets. You know, if you look at the Black Panther Party program, its program is basically reformist. There's nothing revolutionary in the Black Panther Party 10-pointer program. Right. It says we want a decent education, fit for, the, fit for our children. We want decent housing, fit to live mm -hmm. in. We want medical care. You know, we want to enter police brutality. There's nothing revolutionary about those demands. Right. But they were revolutionary because in the context of how black people mm. were being treated in the U.S., they represented a whole change in the paradigm of institutions interface with people of color yeah. and black people. Mm. Okay, And one of the reasons, and I don't want to segue too far, one of the reasons that we people cannot understand why we have to revisit voting rights every 10 years, we have to go back and fight for it again, that we have to talk about rebranding schools from from segregated to to uh, to charter schools. We're always fighting for these basic things in our community. We're talking about buy black and all the black capitalism. We're talking about all of these things because we don't understand that the fundamental relationship between African people in the United States and the descendants of so-called chattel slaves from Africa is that it's a colonial relationship. We are an internalized colony. The black community, the hood, is a colony. That's why the police behave that way in right. our community. Right. Okay, they act like an occupying force. If you look at a movie in Afghanistan, they kick the doors in three o'clock in the morning, going in people's houses looking for the Taliban. They kick the doors in our clock houses three o'clock in the morning and kill grandmothers, so saying they're looking for drugs. Gentrification. Well, it's also called the militarization of police, which began know. with the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. by the way. So, so the Black Panther Party, like I said, started organizing NCCFs because they were infiltrated. And the NCCFs were chapters that, that behaved like a panther, maybe even looked like a panther, but they weren't panthers. They weren't members. So we tried to establish that so the party couldn't be infiltrated and opportunists, you know, used, you know, misbehavior and bad behavior in the community to, you know, to smear the image of the panthers, okay? But at the same time, from after the Panthers have grown and become this target of police brutality and police murder, you have to understand during the lifetime of the Black Panthers, over 35 Panthers were killed by law enforcement. Wow. And, and, and agents of the state, like the US organization headed by Ron Karanga and um, the one, the founder of Kwanzaa. And so we have to look at, 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 at this state that we were in. We were in a state of war. How would we fight back? You know, our right to arm, be armed legally was taken f away from us by the legislature, mm -hmm. okay? That was, and then the police was, was attacking our headquarters. They were arresting our Panthers in the streets who were selling the newspaper. They were hijacking newspaper shipments around the country and diverting them so that we couldn't sell papers, and that was our major source of income, wow. okay? Mm -hmm. They were raiding our homes. They were going to landlords, telling landlords, you understand, that we were, that we were terrorists, and the landlords were kicking us out of houses. So how were we to fight back? So the BLA was an outgrowth of well, the BLA was an underground component of the Black Panther Party. It was under the it was it, but the BLA at that time was called it, actually it wasn't called the BLA mm -hmm. on the West Coast. It was actually called the African American Liberation Army. 
And that that name changed as a result of the split in the Black Panther Party between East and West Coast, hmm. which is a whole nother story. Whole nother. So so so, it, yes. Wow. So after the split in the Black Panther Sounds Party, familiar. after the, after the split in the Black Panther Party, um, the predominant underground forces were on the East and Southeast Coast. Hmm. Okay. And so the government decided to focus on that because the West Coast had already moved into into gangsterism and prostitution right. and 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 and, a, and um, you know in that uh, pork barrel politics that's going on, and so um, so they went after what they called the so-called Cleaver faction, mm-hmm. or the Black Panther Party, named after Eldridge yeah, Cleaver. Who, right. Yeah. So that was the BLA. Sure. And so so anyway, what I was trying to say was the Black Panther Party had an under, underground that took care of, of all of the security, community security um, uh, things for the party. It took care of the housing, making sure that the houses were secure. Sort it, of like a fruits of Islam type of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, except that we didn't use karate. Right. <laughs> so, and we didn't use K-Razor. Right. You know, it, so, so, it, so this was the organized, um, underground so to speak and you got to understand there was underground movements all across the united states armed movements there was underground white movement the weather underground right. which which weather developed movement. which developed after the townhouse bombing in new york there was the um there was the fal faln the puerto rican liberation movement front for the liberation of puerto rico mm. um there was the um there was the underground um, um, uh, Las Rasa of the, of the Chicano movement, and all, and and so there were underground movements in the United States, okay, that came out of the radical mass movements that were going on in the 60s. 60s. You see, so what happened is that the police understood that they could not really infiltrate the underground the way, same way they could infiltrate a mass organization in which the, you know, membership was open. And the underground also attracted former veterans. Uh, Geronimo was a member of the underground before he became above ground. So there were Panthers who were who were recruited that never, you know, never marched in a demonstration, right. never went into a, um, a, a Panther office. Okay, but they followed the. Um, they were organized into cadres. They were organized into um, into cells and teams. Okay, and this is the unique flavor of the Black Panther Party that I was alluding to. Not only was it a, um, a revolutionary nationalist organization, it was an internationalist organization because of its politics, because of its politics of anti-imperialism, its politics of, of, of anti-white supremacy, and it was a cadre organization, which means it was organized along certain principles of democratic centralism. No other black organization had that type of, of, of uh, 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 impact. I kind of want to bring the, the, the discussion to hip hop and hip hop's responsibility right. in everything, and bringing our guests. Yeah, well, let's 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 we'll start by introducing our, our next guest. who was joined by um, yeah. the Siri X, peace, peace, you know, good brother. And you know, we just as you as you can see, we're we're just getting into the conversation yeah, with brother hey. Deruba, hey. and um, you know, just just briefly, like you know, what you was talking about, brother, it made me think about how uh, a COINTEL Pro is alive and breathing today. Um, we don't use that word anymore. Um, you also mentioned the, the East and West Coast beef between the Black Panthers, which is very interesting. I, I was mm. totally not a, uh, aware of that. Um, you weren't? That, you weren't? No. You know, the legacy of the beef that, 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 that y'all, that y'all um, in the hip-hop community yeah, that's have, what, have... that's where I was going to. Well, exactly, you know, yes. the basis of that comes out of the repression of, of of black nationalist movements on the streets. See, people really don't appreciate that at that time there was also a division between cultural nationalism, what we call cultural nationalists, or, or, or the derogatory term we use, pork chop nationalists, and, 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 and revolutionary nationalism. The, the, the legacy of revolutionary nationalism by most Pan-Africans and young activists came out of Malcolm X. It's, it's, it's almost grows root and branch right. from Malcolm X, from, uh, from the radical, that radical side of the movement. Whereas the cultural nationalists almost exclusively come out of what I, I call 
the messianic side of the movement. You know, the movements that were based on abstract spiritualism and 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 you know the once we were king syndrome. You know, we can, we once we were great kings and queens. Right. You understand? So you know we should walk around. And back then the cultural nationalist was really on it. You know, the sister had to walk two steps behind them, dashikis. and they was wearing their dashikis mm -hmm. and all of this stuff. But on the West Coast, this was an affectation of because it was a it was a a, a discovery mm -hmm. of black is beautiful right. and the and the founder of black is beautiful just was buried yesterday mm. the founder of black is beautiful in america alombe brath who Alombe held the Brad. first black is beautiful um uh, pageant who was the first one to organize a model agency what year was that what year was that 1956 wow. And um, and 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 in 19 and in the 1960s, founded the Black Model Agency, and also, but the, and their connection was to the jazz, was to the jazz industry. So Abby Lincoln, uh, you, if you if any of you all know of Abby Lincoln, she was one of the first major jazz artists that had a natural. Hmm. Everybody, you know, Nina Simone, Abby Lincoln. So this this was attached to this brother that just passed, my mentor, Alombe uh, Brath. Brath. May Allah be pleased with him. And um, and 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 so, this black is beautiful has morphed over the years into a cultural worship of African history and Africa, Africa and our African roots. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I think I'm as Afrocentric as any. I live in Africa. Yeah. You know. So so I think I'm just as Afrocentric as anyone. But cultural nationalism was an extreme that became right wing. In a sense, right? Okay, became very conservative in a sense. So commercialized, so, but but then it wasn't even commercialized. It was used against legitimate black militancy, mm. because legitimate black militancy militancy at that time was talking about activism in the street, right, anti right, right. anti police brutality. You know, organizing people to defend themselves. You know, taking over buildings and 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 and, and running them ourselves. You know, creating our own empowering ourselves right. using the term power to the people. Whereas the cultural national we're talking about, you know, uh, white folks is the enemy, they're the devil, and all of these things, you know, whereas the revolutionary nationalists had white folks buying guns for them. Right. You know, and, 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 and the narrow nationalists and the cultural nationalists wasn't even talking to white folks. So they wouldn't even know who would buy a gun for them. But at that, my point is, is that there was always this dichotomy. And this dichotomy grew and grew, and when one was removed from the scene, it was the one that was left that rose to ascendancy. Mm -hmm. And it was that from those roots that you have the NWA, all of those organizations Bastards on the West the Party. That's right. All of them organizations on the on on the, on the on the West Coast, right. you understand? And it's it is no coincidence that that's that, that 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 the genre of so called gangster rap, misogyny, has all come out of that. Whereas you see on the East Coast you had, you know, you had conscious more conscious rap, you know, you had Public Enemies, Carol yeah, Swans, the Black Yeah, yeah. and uh, what was the other group? Uh, Poor Righteous Teachers. Poor Righteous Teachers, Rest in Peace, Father Shahid. Yeah, you have so. all you had all of this trend, you see. But in the days as this was gelling back in, when they split the party like I said they went after the front that was more militant that was more armed that was more focused on police murder and police brutality right. they went after those rather than the other ones that had reverted into gangsterism and culturalism they already brainwashed now we we, we, we they fell into the to the to the to the uh you know the the mold or the model. That but let set. let me just give sum it up by saying this: There's an FBI document that says, and I showed it to you when we was organizing the campaign. Remember that document? The FBI document that says that the black ghetto youth should be made to understand that if they succumb to revolutionary ideology and follow revolution revolutionaries, they would be dead revolutionaries. Mm. That it's better that they become an entertainer, a ball player, a sports figure, beloved by the white population, than someone who is hated by the system. This was an FBI this memo. This is an FBI memo. Yeah, this is a COINTELPRO memo. See